Good evening, and thank you so much for the invitation to speak with you tonight. I am delighted to see so many of you here wearing glasses. Um, my talk is about the eye chart, and specifically the eye chart we think we know from our annual checkups at the eye doctors, one that has been long associated with its primary inventor, the Utrecht ophthalmologist Hermann Snellen, who invented the chart that we know, or at least the original version of the chart we know, in 1862. Um, my interest in this subject, which is admittedly a very peculiar and specific one, grew out of my longstanding interest in uh, early modern culture, particularly in Northern Europe. And the question that I was trying to address for myself, which was, how did people see, or how well could people see in Shakespeare's time? And that, in turn, led to the question, how would anybody know? Um, we know certain things about vision and its measurement. We have a few fragmentary pieces of information from antiquity and the late Middle Ages. But the most important thing for most of us is probably the invention of spectacles or eyeglasses in the Middle Ages. And we have some pictures, some images from uh, paintings and frescoes and engravings and woodcuts that give us some idea of what it might have looked like to wear these appliances. However, the, the plot, if there is one, of the book I've written is the way in which medicine, culture, popular culture, history, and the military all crisscross in the presence of this thing we call the eye chart. And let me try to explain this as we go on. First of all, this is the classic Snellen eye chart, or a version of the classic Snellen eye chart. You will all recognize it because of the big E at the top, which is like the dead giveaway. It has 11 lines. 11 lines is very important. And if you go to line 8, you will get to a point where the examining medical professional will tell you with confidence, well, you read that line, you're good. That is the line at which <clears throat> we say you have 2020 vision. Um, it is a common misconception and one consistently perpetrated uh, through popular culture. I would say even through the media, when you have a television program called 2020, it might suggest that its vision is perfect. It's not about perfection. It's about a certain norm. Even if you were able to read to the very bottom line, and there are very few people who can do that, but if they could, our vision as humans is nothing compared to that of certain birds or other animals with extraordinarily uh, precise and powerful uh, visual capabilities. 2020 is a term we've all internalized. It means something like, oh, your vision is perfect. Um, what it does mean is that for Hermann Snellen and the, and the diagnostic procedure he developed in the 1860s, the ideal viewer at 20 feet could read that without difficulty. And I'll talk more about this as we go forward. It should become immediately apparent, since I did not begin with something uh, learned about typography, that I am not a historian of typography. I'm not an artist or a designer. My interests are more in cultural history, but I'm hoping to connect pieces in ways that might um, be useful for those of you who work directly on type, or also those who are interested in the, uh, the history of our relation to medicine. And I think one of the key things about the eye chart, the Snellen chart in particular, is that it's a mediating term between the clinical practice of medical examination and what I think of as the chaos of the body. Uh, the eye chart is about trying to determine from the chaos of the body what we can know definitively about our eyes. Um, this is Hermann Snellen, 
an image taken probably late in his life. Uh, he did almost all of his important work in Utrecht. He's wearing medals in this image. I like to think these are medals he has been awarded for his service to the ophthalmological community. The 19th century is often referred to as the golden age of ophthalmology. Most of the great breakthroughs in the study of the eye happened in the 19th century. Yes, there are many, many important things that have happened since. But in the 19th century, um, significant advances were made in terms of both examination, treatment, and diagnosis. The eye chart we'll talk about, or I'll be talking about over the next 45 minutes or so, is one of the key pieces. But it is not the only piece, and nor is this the only eye chart that one needs to think about to understand how vision was measured and what it might mean. <clears throat> this image is from the World Health Organization. It is a medical professional somewhere in Africa testing the vision of an unidentified uh, woman. Uh, you can see in the top right of the frame what appears to be Arabic. And the image is not a Snellen chart in the sense that you may know it with an E at the top. But if you've seen this chart before, this is called the Landolt chart. And it is a C, a broken C that is rotated in several directions. Now, why is that important? As early as the 1860s, when he was developing the chart we know, or at least the, the uh, parent of the chart we know, Herman Snellen understood that one of the challenges for medical professionals was to determine how can you test children, people who are unlettered, people who do not have the Roman alphabet as their um, linguistic foundation. And so it was important to develop something that did not depend upon knowing the alphabet. The Landolt chart was, was developed a little bit later in France um, and has become incredibly important in terms of reaching those populations. There are many variants on Landolt, but the Landolt chart in its sort of pyramidal, torpedo-like uh, arrangement uh, is clearly echoing what Herman Snellen had in mind. The Snellen chart itself has, I think, three separate consequences for us. One is its effect upon the development of medical technology, and in particular, medical graphics. I think there is not a single more important or visible medical graphic since print than the Snellen chart. I'm trying to think of what there might be that would be more significant, more widely known, and I've not been able to come up with one. I think the eye chart is it. If we're going to turn to medical graphics, you can come up with, um, you come up with books of anatomy and so forth, but that's not quite the same thing. This is a purposely designed um, <clears throat> diagnostic object that has had a profound influence on the way we imagine understanding what it means to see well. The second thing that the Snellen chart has given us, or to continue the image I've been using, the second consequence of the Snellen chart is what I would call its syntax. And that is its arrangement of elements such that we are able to understand, quote, its message. We know that it's about testing. We know that there is a progress from the top to the bottom. We know that there is a key moment in Snellen's arrangement. It's line eight. There can be various other ways of arranging that. But there is the sense that those elements correspond to a syntactic architecture that can be translated from one chart to another chart to another chart. Um, the other important thing about the Snellen chart, and things like the Landau chart, and that's much easier with Landau, is that it can't be read. That is, it's not words. 
the chart that Snellen devised is not meant to be readable in the sense of language. It's supposed to be independent, non-signifying symbols. Um, there had been attempts in the later 17th century to create a particular kind of testing diagnostic that involved lines of poetry. And you can easily imagine what happens. If you know the beginning of the line of poetry, you'll figure out the end of it. Just, just for example, imagine going to the eye doctor and the chart begins, oh, say can you blank. And you're going to add, what the, you can read the whole line. So you'll say, oh, say can you see, fine. Or land of hope and glory. And you can fill these in. But there was, there was an attempt to create a diagnostic in one very famous particular case where they were testing telescopes in Italy that used that sort of approach. The important thing about the Snellen chart and all eye charts is that they are intentionally unreadable in two ways. The first way is that the letters cannot add up to anything that would allow you to identify a phoneme or an element of a word and then guess what it is. And secondly, it's supposed to be unreadable in the sense that you cannot read all the way to the bottom. Let me just repeat that. The objective of an eye test is for you to fail. Because only by failing, by finding the moment where it's too faint or too fuzzy for you to figure out what comes next, can your medical professional make a judgment as to the strength of your eyes. The third consequence of the Snellen eye chart is what I would call the meme. Um, in this one, you are the cheese to my macaroni XO. Um, once you begin looking for examples of the Snellen syntax in its snarkiest forms, you will find it everywhere. You will find it on t-shirts, you will find it on objects, you will find it in advertising. In fact, it becomes a little irritating because once you do know that it's there, you will see it absolutely uh, in you will absolutely see it in more places than you imagine you ever would. Um, but I think this is a very important significant. This is a very important piece of how Snellen has influenced us, and we'll re I'll get to that a little bit later. So we have both the medical, the syntactic, and I think the meme dimension of the Snellen project. This is a good example, I think, of how the meme works. This is uh, <clears throat> Justin Timberlake. This is not from my personal collection. This is Justin Timberlake's album, The 2020 Experience. And I would point out that not only is he uh, positioned in front of the uh, huge fluoroscope that you might uh, be put, placed in front of in a contemporary uh, eye exam, but that the syntactic arrangements here, JT is initials, and then the smaller, the next line of type is smaller, and the next line of type is smaller after that, is, um, is a nod to the way in which the Snellen chart from the very beginning imagined a set of typographic relationships um, that help us identify immediately. All you need is three lines. In fact, as in fairy tales and um, <clears throat> uh, uh, I'm thinking of dreams here, but let's say fairy tales and other stories, three is the minimum number you need to identify a rep to have a repetition that provides a significant uh, effect upon the reader or the viewer. And so reducing the Snellen chart with its 11 lines to a mere three is just enough for us to be able to say, ah, got it. He's making a reference to the Snellen chart. Of course, we have the fluoroscope there. But I think the package comes together quite nicely to make a couple of points about the way in which Snellen's syntax has um, populated or infected our sense of what we can do um, with clever type. I want to step back. Because Snellen's story takes us from 1862 to today, 
and turn to some of the early uh, examples of evidence of um, glasses. Um, this is a 14th century fresco by Tommaso da Modena, and it is, as far as we know, the very first surviving image representing someone wearing a pair of glasses. You will notice that the glasses are hinged. Um, they, I think the German term is Nietbrille. You can take them off and just fold them and put them away. They do not have these arms, which my optometrist insists upon calling temples, which confuses me. Um, uh, but this form of eyeglass is one that shows up for at least 100 years. And this is the earliest example that we have. As in most things, if there's a fresco or representation in art of an artifact of this kind, it's fairly certain that that thing has existed for quite a while before we get to that image. So I'm perfectly happy without any empirical evidence to push the invention of this particular appliance back at least several decades. And this, <clears throat> somewhat later, is a representation of St. Jerome by Domenico Ghirlandaio. And if you go if you look through this crowded image, you can see here his scissors and his inks. And here are his little glasses. They're very cute. They hang on a little um, hook. He stares out at us. It is um, a common dimension of representations of the church fathers in the Renaissance to include a uh, pair of glasses. Glasses make people look smart, uh, or at least gives them the impression that they may possibly be smart. In, in painting, it's important to show off uh, the learnedness and seriousness of the holy figures when they are connected to scholarship, as uh, Ambrose and uh, Jerome were. Um, and lots of other people simply like having their, uh, um, uh, their faces recorded with glasses in order to show that they are serious about whatever it is they imagine themselves doing. This is not such an example, but it's so wonderful I had to show it. Um, <clears throat> Happy Halloween. This is the only surviving element of an extraordinary piece of armor made and, and uh, given to Henry VIII of England. Um, I don't think it's widely known or widely shown. I don't think it's ever traveled in the US. This is in Leeds, in the Royal Armory in Leeds in the UK. And it's just a fabulous piece. It's got horns. It's uh, this whole face plate here lifts, so the face is underneath. Um, but you can see that there are uh, glasses permanently attached to the face, and there are holes there for the eyes. Presumably, Henry could wear this for some evidently terrifying event, but it would not have been used in battle. Uh, it's, I think, one of the most extraordinarily beautiful pieces of early armor, and certainly the only one I can think of, and I'm not a specialist in armor, uh, that has glasses, uh, has spectacles attached to it. There are no lenses in the spectacle. Um, which takes me to perhaps the piece of this story that got me going. Um, a number of years ago, I came across this, a reference to this work. This is the uh, uso de los antojos para todo género de vistas, which means the, the use of spectacles for all kinds of vision. This is a book that was published in Seville in 1623, which is the year of Shakespeare's first folio. Um, the author was a Spanish monk. The work is written in Spanish. It is not written in Latin. And it is sometimes referred to as the holy grail of ophthalmology. Uh, maybe there were 10 times as many copies of Shakespeare's first folio as there are extant of this book. I 
think maybe 17 or 18 copies have been found in collections. There is one, I don't think there's one in New York. I went to uh, the National Academies in Bethesda to look at their copy. It's a small paperback. And it is, among other things, uh, noteworthy for the crazy, wonderfully crazy design. This is sort of, if you work in early modern books, as I do, this is like catnip because it's got all this type doing all this strange stuff. And you just want to sit with somebody and say, how did you come up with those solutions for the problem of delivering information? But I want to call your attention in particular to this extraordinary plate here in which you have a pair of spectacles. And the spectacles seem to be the source of light. It, is, it, seems, it seems to me that this is a representation of the theory of extra omission, which is one of the prevalent theories of vision. That is, you saw things because you sent these beams out from your eye. They capture the image and drag them back in. Um, the uh, little eyes in the corner, and then you have lenses, convex and concave lenses on the sides. A very busy, very complicated design that seems to be trying to hit all the points of the book that's going to follow. Now, this is a work written by a monk. It has a long, quite tedious devotional poem to the Virgin. Uh, and then it talks about what lenses do and how they work. Um, it is important in the history of thinking about the subject because these, this book is the first time anyone had printed an attempt to um, uh, provide a scale for testing eye acuity. And this is what it looks like. So in a sense, this is the very, very first real printed eye chart. It's not anything like Snellen but it's a test that you can undertake. And however it works, these calibrations would correspond to lenses of particular strength. And I think of it rather the way you might trace your foot around, trace your foot on a piece of paper if you're buying boots from L.L. Bean. It's a kind of a self-test. The self-test element of this is really important, it seems to me. Because one of the things that's happening at the beginning of the 17th century is the enormous increase in information about telescopes and microscopes. These are inventions of the extraordinary. The heavens, the world we cannot see with the naked eye. And then there is the development and the further refinement of spectacles, which are devices of the ordinary. They help us see the ordinary world much better than we could on our own. But they're not spectacular the way the microscope would be and the way Galileo's telescopes were. <laughs> um, among the things that struck me immediately when I read this work, and I read it in Spanish before I found an English translation, which came out a little bit later, is that it's funny. It's got stories. Characters show up in this, because in order to make the point of how uh, useful it would be to understand what lenses do and how eye weaknesses differ from person to person. The author, whose name is Dasa de Valdez, Dasa creates characters. <clears throat> he has characters who come from the Indies to Spain because they've seen a fabulous pair of eyeglasses. This is sort of like sex in the city without the sex and now without the city. Um, <clears throat> But they come to Spain in order to buy a beautiful pair of eyeglasses they've recently seen, and they get their eyes examined. And then they have all these stories about, well, I can see this, I can't see that. They're all straw men. They're all set up for, for pedagogical purposes. Um, but it, there are real jokes, which I won't have time to go into tonight. And um, it's surprising how uh, easy the text is to read. We know very, very little about its audience. It was never reprinted. Its license expired a few years after uh, the author's death. It was never translated. There was a translation, a partial translation into French. It was never published. It was never published into Latin, which means it was really meant for local consumption in Spain 
and <clears throat> the rest of the Spanish-speaking world, which of course was a large place. But nothing really happened with this. This is another one of the grids in the book. Um, and uh, I look at these marvelous things and try to guess how they might be used. I don't quite know. But I'm also amazed that someone would have found a means of calibrating that could then be shared. It was not a secret. It was not something that was going to be contained by a confraternity of physicians. It was something that the public could have. So this, there was immediately a democratizing gesture in the publication of this rather sweet little book. It looks like nothing. When you pick it up, you have a chance to pick up a copy, which you only have if you go to a rare book collection. Um, but I, it's a book that deserved to be much better known. And its engagement with real people's lives at the beginning of the 17th century is something that I think deserves considerably more attention than it has received. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that there have been some tests at the end of the, later in the 17th century with telescopes uh, that involved pieces of poetry. Um, to make that a little clearer, there, were, there was a, a battle between two telescope manufacturers. One was in Florence, one was in Rome, each claiming they had the better telescope. And a chart was set up midway between the two cities. And they trained their telescopes on this chart as a way of trying to determine whether one telescope was finer than the other. It was really not a very successful way of testing things. But as an element in the history of a technology, it's kind of remarkable to see an uh, attempt to create an eye chart that could be used for a 50, possibly a 50-foot telescope. Um, the 18th century is a period of huge growth in literacy uh, in England and elsewhere. Um, but one of the things that the eye chart is doing and that eye um, acuity and its evaluation is doing is tying into a number of things. You know, since the end of the 16th century, we have growth in printing, growth in the number of books, growth in the number of people who can read. Once you have people who can read, you have people who need eyeglasses to help them see the page better. All these things are coming together. The more need there is for glasses, the more need there is to get our knowledge of glasses uh, to be more precise. If, for example, you wanted to buy glasses in the 16th century, spectacles in the 16th century, you might, be, you might visit someone who, who was a lens maker. And it would try things on, and you'd try to find the one that fit best. And that's what people did. But there was not yet any systematic way of determining what your particular visual strength was. The 18th century was very concerned with lenses, but not particularly with developing new forms of evaluating uh, uh, visual strength through graphic means. So I don't have anything to show you that's particularly nice except this, which is Again, uh, if you work on book history, you love these crazy title pages with 17 different things going on on the page. But what I like about this particularly is that it uses glasses, spectacles, as a metaphor for being in a state of grace. So this is a discovery of the snake in the grass or a spectacle for weak eyes. What is that? Being a sermon preached at the Archdeacon's visitation at Castor in the county of Lincoln in 1716. So the idea that um, grace or an uh, enlightened sermon by a devout minister could function for your soul the way eyeglasses could for your eyes tells us something about the way in which the notion of spectacles has now been metaphorized into other dimensions of people's lives. Um, the primary work on eye charts and the evaluation of uh, visual strength occurs in the 19th century in Germany, Austria, and in the Netherlands. Um, 
Heinrich Küchler, who, this is fuzzy, it's not Gerard. Um, uh, Heinrich Küchler was a, a German ophthalmologist whose interest was in trying to determine how one might create a test for his patients that would have a series of elements and he could then ask them, what is that, what is that? He had begun with objects, and objects were complicated. They did, there was too much information in an object. He would cut these out of calendars and create basically a poster, what we consider today a poster. This is actually three separate charts, and this is the only, the, I think these are the only surviving uh, examples of Kishler's um, ophthalmological work. What he's done is he's cut out uh, words from other uh, sources and stack them up. And if you, uh, if you know German, you can read across that Auge, Reich, Jagd, I, Empire, Hunt. Already sounds very German, doesn't it? Uh, Mainz, Bauer, Hund. Mainz, the city of Mainz, Bauer is a farmer, Hund is a dog, Schloss, Ruine, Gebirg, Castle, Ruins, Mountains. Um, it feels as if it's a sort of keyword search for early German romanticism turned into, into uh, 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 an eye examination diagnostic tool. But the difficulty, of course, is that once you know you see S and the CH ligature, you're likely to guess it's Schloss, it's Castle. You might see B-A-U and you're going to guess it's Bauer. Uh, these are not terribly obscure words. So the problem of recognition, completion, and therefore memorization has not been solved here. But a, the key thing, I think, is the stacking. The stacking element is a considerable advance over any other um, idea of what you might use to, tests, to test people's um, visual strength. Now, I don't know whether you can, anyone recognizes this unless they're medical professionals, but this is a, sorry, we're skipping one ahead. Um, this is um, a, an, an ophthalmoscope. It's actually a copy of an ophthalmoscope. I don't think there are, I don't know whether any of the original ones survive. The, ophthalmo, the ophthalmoscope, it's very difficult to say, was invented in 1851 by uh, von Helmholtz. And it's probably the single most important piece of medical technology, uh, other non-graphic medical technology uh, in the 19th century. Um, the, uh, the ophthalmoscope allows the physician to see the fundus, the back of the eye, through a series of mirrors. And with that tool, the entire history um, of ophthalmological practice has been changed. There is a vast uh, archive of new information that a physician or the person examining you can secure through the deployment of, of the ophthalmoscope. Um, so 1851, we're already, not, we're now in the key period from 1851 to, eight, to the next 15 years. That is, that's sort of the sweet spot for the most important developments in uh, ophthalmological um, and diagnostic work in the 19th century. This gentleman with the impressive side chops is the uh, Viennese physician Edward Jaeger, probably not a name you will know. Now, when you have your eyes examined, usually two things happen. You're shown a chart on the wall, which is or is not some version of something that looks like the Snellen chart. And that's what you concentrate on. But it's very possible that you're already, you also passed a small card and said, please hold this at a comfortable distance and read it. And what you might have on that card is a series of texts, texts, not words, but passages, and smaller and larger, small type, larger and larger and larger. That particular diagnostic is the invention of Edward Jaeger in the 1850s. What Jaeger wanted to do was to see 
not whether people could read Hunt, Gebirg, and Bauer from a distance, but what was it like for them to read a passage, a text? And so his work um, gave us something like this. This is the sort of thing you might see uh, if you were at uh, a physician's and being asked to read a card. Children should be allowed to use only such books as are printed in large, clear type and excessive reading forbidden. That apparently is a sample of the sort of text we should all be studying if we go to the eye doctors. This is what it would have looked like, or something like, in the 19th century. This is a, an example from a 19th century test type booklet. Um, Jaeger's texts had small type in paragraphs, larger, 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 and larger. With the loyalty disposed, sorry, I can read this. With the loyalty disposed to remain, he busied himself in improving the defenses of the constant anxiety, yet enduring hope, with which Washington watched this hazardous enterprise. We have evidence in his various letters. To Arnold, when on point, Levi baffled in the expectation of finding the means of making a dash, and so forth and so on. Um, what's happening here is that these passages connect. So you have this weird sort of postmodern effect, if you look at one of these things in its completeness, of having maybe 11 different passages beginning in very, very small type, getting larger and larger and larger and larger, and then it breaks off and you turn the page, and it'll be in a different language for a different reader, a different uh, patient. It's a very, very strange, uh, very, very strange visual artifact but it's kind of wonderful in terms of the use of type as a way of uh, testing, testing the patient's ability to, under, to really to read. Not really to see, but really to read. So with Snellen, you're dealing with symbols. With Jaeger, you're dealing with context. And in an odd sort of way, what you're doing here is um, coming up with two protocols of reading, and between the two of them, you're determining the health of your patient's eyes. Snellen's work was important, interesting, but also lucky. In 1862, the British Army was concerned about the quality of its recruits, and in particular, what they were concerned about is, who could you give a gun to? Things haven't changed. Um, uh, what, was, what was worrying the British Army was, who could you give a rifle to? What man could be entrusted with a rifle? What could he see? There was no easy way of determining the strength of the eyes of the recruits. And the Snellen chart appeared just at the right moment. So within a couple of years of Snellen's publication of the chart in 1862, the, Her, Her Majesty's Armed Forces picked up the Snellen chart and needed some variations because almost 10% of the recruits were illiterate. And so the, having letters wouldn't help. So we had to put dots on things. Nonetheless, um, the military uh, embrace of Snellen's chart, sent it throughout the world. And it was that event, that uh, adoption by the British Army, that probably has been the most significant in terms of making this an international uh, tool for visual analysis. <clears throat> the military has always had an important uh, dependence upon uh, visual strength. And one of the wonderful things that happens um, is that the British uh, the Victorian and Edwardian military then begin to fine tune what they require in terms of visual strength. So um, I write a little bit about this in the book, but um, for the various appointments in India, in England, in Ireland, each one of the appointments would have a visual specification. 
You had to be able to see X in order to become the postal whatever. You had to be, have, you had to be, had to be able to see this, this well in order to have this appointment in the Indian forestry. Um, so clearly, it was not merely a matter of helping the army figure out who could uh, point a rifle well and accurately, but it was being used in many other kinds of ways as well. <coughs> Excuse me. An early Snellen chart looked something like this. Um, the slab letters were uh, of the period. Um, I believe Snellen himself did not want serifs on the letters, but they were very popular, and when he think he tried to do them without serifs, and people got very cross, so the serifs went back in. Um, this does not correspond to the 11 lines, and not these may not these were not the letters always used. There were many variants, but the basic principle, big letter on top coming down, um, and this vaguely Egyptian style, as it was called, uh, is prevalent in the later 19th century. Um, this man um, <clears throat> is not one of the heroes. He's sort of the villain of the piece. Um, this is Cesare Lombroso, an Italian criminologist. Um, Lombroso was important for coming up with a project which he called the Luomo Deliquente, or Criminal Man. Um, Lombroso believed that by the careful study of facial uh, arrangements, including the shape of your nose, the size of your ears, whether you had weak chin, whether your eyes were too close together, the size of your, the breadth of your brow, he could determine whether you had inherited criminal tendencies and therefore could predict the likelihood that you would be a criminal. Now it sounds sort of ridiculous now, but not entirely, because Lombroso's ideas about the relation of the body to criminal tendencies had a profound effect upon the development of modern criminology. Um, the, w the point at which Snellen's work intersects with Lombroso's is that one of the um, diagnostic procedures under the spell of Lombroso's understanding was, by, was to test criminals to see what their eye test results would be. And there are these very, very strange and fascinating um, uh, results cal calculating which class of criminal had what level of visual acuity. And there's at least one that I came across that suggested that murderers saw a little better than common thieves. I don't know what one does with this as a fact, if it is a fact, because I think the sample was quite small. But, but we can at least conclude that if people were recording and disseminating results of that kind, they were sufficiently engaged in that level of, um, shall we say, misapprehension about how the sensory uh, organs work, um, that it's worth thinking about in terms of the development of our understanding of uh, um, racism, uh, because there was an enormous amount of racism in Lombroso's uh, uh, representations of criminal types. Um, and more of this can be uh, unpacked. Um, <clears throat> the military was not simply the place uh, where Snellen was given uh, his most important patronage, uh, but also in Japan. Um, this is, I hope you can see this, this is a colorblindness test. There are numbers there. Um, and this is, was developed in Japan uh, around the time of the First World War. Uh, the Ishihara test is pretty much unchanged over a century later because the Japanese also had a need to find out how good their recruits were. What I don't know is why they determined that colorblindness was the most important thing, but perhaps because they already had Snellen, they needed to do something more nuanced and in a different direction. But the, the, uh, the, color, the, the Ishihara colorblindness test um, emerges just about the time of the First World War. 
and then becomes integrated globally in terms of diagnostic practice um, for understanding um, what it means to be colorblind. Uh, those Victorian uh, specifications I mentioned a few minutes ago about the strength of your eyes for each of these various appointments included, I think, colorblindness. You had to be able to see certain colors. I'm not sure all the colors, but certain colors at least, in order to get a particular uh, appointment. Presumably you, need to be able to, presumably, you needed to be able to see green if you were being appointed in the forestry, but I'm just guessing. Um, <clears throat> this is an extraordinary photograph from the Imperial, sorry, from the Imperial War Museum in England. And this is a young recruit, it looks like a movie still. This is a young recruit who's being tested for his eyes. Uh, with the examining officer, one hand on his shoulder, pointing not to the camera, but to the chart where we are. This is like, a, this is some sort of the grim version of Las Meninas um, with the, it's like, please don't point in my direction. But I just think it's a fabulous picture. I was, have been looking for quite a while for an image of someone being tested uh, for um, eye strength uh, during early wartime and came across this one. This is a little later. This is in Germany. And uh, I mean, it's obviously clearly, again, clearly a stage photograph. We've got this young man who's being tested, having his height measured and these rather chilly gentlemen are holding pieces of paper. Um, and uh, the chart we see, we can't see terribly clearly. There seem to be numbers on the left and um, letters on the right. And it's not sort of classic Snellen, but we still have the, the strong letters at the top and then the letters becoming um, smaller going down. And uh, the person being examined is covering one eye because the eye chart always t tests, as you remember, one eye at a time. So the chart itself, um, it's easy to imagine uh, that the chart will tell us about our eyes. In practice, the chart only tells us certain kinds of things. Um, the chart allows your examining uh, medical professional to make certain judgments about the strength of your eyes. I don't know, uh, most of us go to the eye doctor once a year. That's about the frequency at which you were expected to see this thing. It'd be like a Christmas card. You wouldn't see one every single day. You'd see it once a year. Um, but in the age of uh, mechanical overproduction, we have this image, this visual syntax uh, available to us with, uh, with increasing frequency, certainly since the 1960s, the idea of the eye chart became both something we took for granted and perhaps a bit of a joke, which allowed us to be in on the joke. This is not a joke. This is another type of eye chart, once again, like the Landolt C, intended for people who cannot either uh, read the Latin alphabet or are not uh, are, are unable to read at all, or for children. Um, anyone who has uh, a different set of skills or has not yet developed the skills to read uh, the Latin alphabet. It's, I think it's quite a beautiful one. Um, and here is the Landolt again. Uh, Landolt was a uh, French, I think I mentioned this, worked at the end of the 19th century and examined some of the most important artists uh, in Paris uh, at the end of the 19th century. Uh, people like uh, Degas and uh, Mary Cassatt, who had terrible, terrible vision. Um, one likes to imagine that a chart like this uh, would have been something of a comfort. But um, in any case, it, it still allows the uh, physician to make the discriminations that are necessary. And once again, line eight is where Ideally, you want to be able to bring uh, your, your patient. Uh, I'm not sure what green is here, but you can imagine that this is a place where things are um, a band within which it's more or less possible to correct uh, for strength. 
but you want to get down to that line if possible. And this is maybe my favorite chart. This is from 1907. It was designed by a man named George Meyerly in uh, San Francisco. Um, he was a German optician, and his task was to get people to come to him. He was advertising. And what, what do we have here? We have um, a kind of reverse Snellen with the big letters at the bottom for visual impact. We have uh, the Latin alphabet. We have the German alphabet in its familiar, uh, familiar Gothic style. We have uh, Japanese. We have a symbol, a set of symbols, including the American flag and this rather terrifying eye and then a black dot. We have Chinese, we have Russian, and we have Hebrew. And I'm, I've looked at this now for a while, and I've been trying to think uh, why these languages. Uh, is this a snapshot of who was in San Francisco in 1907? It seems likely that he would want to choose languages that would correspond to potential, uh, to potential uh, clients. Um, I think it's quite, it's quite wonderful. Um, and uh, I don't know what the color stuff is for, but um, it's like an enormous eye test party going on. Any one of those elements by itself might have been quite enough. Um, not that many years after uh, the Meyerly chart and, of course, the San Francisco earthquake, manufacturers began producing charts and, and devices that would allow people to feel comfortable testing themselves, which sounds as if we're going back to what things were like in the 18th century. But if you go to, the, if you go to a drugstore and you want to buy a pair of, quote, reading glasses, which I can't wear, but my father, who had better eyes than I do, could, you would go in for some few bucks. You would wind up buying a rather cheesy but perfectly useful little pair of glasses. Um, I don't know when that happened, when that began, but this is certainly part of that gesture. This is from the late 20s, and it's a little device. Um, I have it up in my office. It weighs about two ounces. It's a piece of balsa wood with a bunch of um, markings on it, and then you a little tiny uh, lens and you slide this piece of metal back and forth until it comes into focus, which is not so different from standing uh, at the Dwayne Reed counter and looking at the glasses that might be available for you. And this, from the 30s, is, uh, how, many of you have, how many of you have seen this image before? Not, not too many. Uh, John is not really dull. He may only need his eyes examined, um, which seems to me a fair enough uh, judgment, although I, I think he looks guilty as sin. And, uh, and I don't know what he's done, but I think she's found out. Um, uh, but it's a beautiful piece of uh, WPA design. Um, significant, I think, because it suggests that, once again, the syntax of Snellen has now been internalized. By the 30s, we're able to do this kind of thing, and people will immediately say, got it. That's a reference to, or that reminds me of the eye chart. So the eye chart, the moral here, go to the eye doctor, or don't assume that your kid is um, stupid, but it may be that he can't see things. Um, you uh, have that as a, as a real message, and you have it um, reinforced by the choice of letters. I was speaking to someone the other night at an event at Cooper. She was an alum, and she told me um, that when she was a child, she was quite, quite, quite an older alum. She told me when she was a child, her mother wished to enter her into beauty contests, and as a result, did not want her to wear glasses. And so when she had her eye exams, her mother would find out, would get a copy of the chart, and drill her daughter so that she would know the answers and how to cheat on the eye chart so that, why? So that you wouldn't have to wear glasses. And she said she wound up walking into things for a long period of time. Um, now, uh, a little hard to read, but one of the critical uh, moments, I think, in the history of optometry has to be the problem Superman had with his eyeglasses. 
uh, in the 1940s, when Superman was basically being created, um, uh, one of the great difficulties is the problem of what do you do? You're writing a comic strip. How do you deal with Superman? He can't n not know about the war. If he takes part in the war, then what happens? Um, and so the writers of the Superman comic strip came up with, I think, a kind of brilliant solution. Actually, I'll give you one of, there are two solutions. So Clark Kent, that's his real name, goes to the eye doctor. He has an eye test, which he fails. And the reason he fails, I believe you can see it, is that he has looked through the wall into the next examining booth and has inadvertently read the eye chart being given to the next patient. And I particularly like the fact that the, the artist knew so little or cared so little or was deliberately going to uh, thumb and nose at Snellen's eye chart that he or she has laid out uh, consecutive letters, which is the one thing we know would not happen on an eye chart, right? Um, so he has looked at the wrong eye chart, and now he's, uh, um, uh, uh, I guess, with Lois. Uh, Hiya, soldier. I presume you're in the army now. Uh, oh, bad news, Lois. I didn't. I don't. I didn't pass the physical examination. And the title of this strip is "The Failure." Um, and here's another version. Like all myths, all, you know, any good myth has more than one version. This is another version from the period in which Superman decides that he could fight in the war, but our boys were doing such a great job that it would really kind of not be good to be flying around there and doing things with superpowers because that wouldn't look good for them. And so he decides to throw the game by reading the chart wrong. So enormous uh, shirtless Clark says here, uh, oh, yes, sir, it's K-F-T-L-Y-N. I knew it, a perfect specimen of manhood in every other respect, and he's blind as a bat. Um, uh, the difficulty of what do you do with Superman. There are yet further comics in which he has indeed somehow overcome all this and is fighting, fighting the Nazis uh, on comic strip time. Um, Among the many attempts to revise and improve the Snellen chart, to change its typography, to change its concept and its diagnostic objectives, the most important might be by Louise Sloan. Dr. Sloan, sorry, Dr. Sloan was at Johns Hopkins. She died, I think, in the 80s. Um, and she came up with this format. Um, it has a different way of measuring uh, the the letters, a different arrangement. Um, it would require more technical knowledge of optometrics than I have. But the Sloan lettering and the Sloan chart has become one of the important ways in which Snellen has been revised. What was key to Snellen's letters? I've mentioned the fact that they were non-consecutive. Um, but I didn't mention the fact that they're built within a cube. Each of the strokes is the same width, and that was very important to Snellen. He felt that he needed to deliver the same uh, quantity of visual information for each of the strokes on each of the letters in his chart. That was new. The other thing that was new was his determining size, or rather relative size. So what makes the Snellen chart work? It was the first chart for which it was possible to determine the size anywhere. Because what you were doing was, was um, establishing a ratio between the distance and the, the, printed, the, printed, um, the printed lettering. It was measured in minutes of visual angle. We live in a, unless you're a comic book character, you live in a 360 degree world. We have about 114, 115 degrees of that's that 360 in our visual field. And as you come down, in, uh, in, as you look at the world, things farther away are small and get bigger as you get closer to them. A tree on the hill is that big and grows as you get closer to it. 
the letters on the Snellen chart were meant to be five minutes of visual arc. And that was a standard that he was able to not only use, but use, uh, make reproducible throughout the world. Uh, the reproducibility of the apparent size of the image and um, the, uh, the evenness of stroke were two uh, key inventions of Snellen, and they've affected all of the subsequent revisions of Snellen's charts, including Sloan's work here. But it's not simply science, and it's not simply medicine. We've managed to make the charts part, uh, the chart and its uh, um, effect of, and its presence in culture um, part of modern advertising. These are shot glasses from Renaissance hardware. I'm not quite sure what the point is, because like you can't read the letters, you don't get the drink. Um, but these are uh, examples of, uh, I even like this better, uh, oh, this is hard, all right. Oh, um, I am so wasted, I can't even read what this says, which is a perfect, a perfect slogan to uh, put on a hip flask. Um, here is Barbie. Uh, Barbie is now a medical professional. And while I'm not a big Barbie person, I'm not even a small Barbie person, what I admire about it is that it takes great pains to reproduce all 11 lines of the Snellen chart. It doesn't cheat. We get all 11, we get the green, we get the red, we get the E on top. I think that kid will be in good shape. Um, and finally, uh, maybe the patron saint of eye exams is Mr. Magoo. This is a screen grab. It's not your eyes. It's just not uh, as good as I could get. Magoo goes for eye tests, and of course, Good things do not happen. But once again, I'm amazed by the decision by the cartoonist to put those letters in that order, given how easy it was to know what a Snellen chart might look like. Instead, they've given this, and I kind of, part of me thinks that's some sort of weird code, an inside joke at the animator's studio. Um, I mentioned before, at the beginning, uh, that. The eye chart works in a place between diagnostics and the chaos of the body. Um, for many people, the eye chart is kind of a humorous thing. Um, it's something you see at the doctor's office. It's the butt of a lot of jokes. You can use it to make jokes and to deliver information. You can use the syntax to create t-shirts that say all sorts of things, many of them terribly rude, and I won't say, I won't. Uh, read those off, but many say things like, I love grandma, she's the best, and that sort of thing. Um, but for others, the, the idea of the eye chart is something you can take more personally. And I'm particularly fond of a couple here. This is, a, this is not the one I was going to show you, but I, this, is, um, this is spooky. I just like spooky. The tough little ghost, uh, he's cheating, rather like the woman whose mother read her what was on the eye chart. Uh, this is, uh, he's cheating the way only ghosts can cheat, by leaning in a ghostly fashion forward, much to the, uh, much to the shock and disapproval of the um, ghostly ophthalmologist. Um, cartoons do this all the time. Here's another cartoon with Uncle Scrooge looking at his money, which has been arranged, again, in a, in a Snellen syntax. Um, and finally, I have two others to show you. Um, this is something totally different. This is how, this is the inter this is the globalization of the Snellen syntax. Um, I dare say no one in the room can read this because, 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 this is a chart designed to represent all 61 languages, according to the people at Sankara, all 61 languages spoken in India. That every letter here is from a different Indian language. Uh, I don't know any of those languages, so I can't tell you the, anything that's on this chart. Um, but I think it's kind of fabulous piece of, uh, of design. Um, and one could spin out a lot of uh, kind of cultural inquiry from that particular piece. This is perhaps even less likely to be identified. Anyone have a guess as to what language this is? Cherokee. Who knew that it was Cherokee? Oh, was it there? Oh, you're a good reader. 
Oh, I see. Then you got it. Yeah, that's Cherokee. And it's, it's, I've never seen a Cherokee eye chart, or I don't think I'd seen Cherokee before working on this project. Um, uh, again, about the syntax, this is, a, this is an art gallery in Slovenia. I just took a picture a couple of years ago where Schutz Galeria in the study Fig in the old city. Um, they don't have to say this is an eye chart. They're just going to use a familiar form and ask you to pay attention. Um, and finally, this is the last slide I'm going to show you. Um, it was kind of wonderful. As a young man was here for an art exhibition a couple a year or so ago, and I, he was wearing this outfit. I said, "Do you mind if I photographed your arm? I'm writing a book on eye charts." He was perfectly nice about it. Um, and uh, here it is. And he, he, I said to him, uh, I took the picture and I said, "You know, you haven't done all 11 lines." He said, "No, I thought nine lines was plenty." And I. <laughs> You know, it's, you can't really argue with someone who's made that decision about a tattoo. Um, but I think it's quite wonderful. And there are others I, I don't have to show you, but there are other people who have done, say, verses of gospel, reduced uh, the language, edited down, and tattooed down an arm or down a leg. And there's something really quite extraordinary, I think, about the way in which people have decided that that... Uh, those kinds of um, reorganizations of one's skin can be meaningful for them. Uh, I, I think, again, it's the idea of the chaos of the body is somehow uh, organized by the eye chart when we're there in a doctor's office, when we're looking at um, objects that have been uh, presented to us in Snellen form, uh, when we encounter people who have taken parts of the eye chart and made it part of them. I think we've said something about the importance and the power of this, uh, this diagnostic tool, which is a great deal, I think, to have accomplished from a simple chart in the middle of the 19th century. Um, I don't know what will happen. There are those who think the Snellen chart is now passe and no one should be using it anymore. Dr. Sloan's chart is one that's probably the ground for the next generation or continuing work on uh, visual examination. But I have to say that one develops a kind of affection for the Snellen chart in all its weirdness, uh, in all its artificiality. It's something we've all lived with and um, I think it's a kind of a, has a kind of poetic quality. Uh, there are certainly poets who think so. Billy Collins has written about how the eye chart is one of the ways he thinks about writing his poems. Um, so I'm going to leave you with that um, because I think that anything else I were to tell you would tell you even more about what I write about in my book. Um, it's, a, it's a long history, but it's a short book. And um, I hope I've given you something you don't know and something that might intrigue you. Thank you so much.